Sports. I'm your host, as always, Preston Bailey. With me, about to have a nervous breakdown, is Cam Vieira. We're having technical difficulties. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if it's the presidential transition. I don't know if North Korea is coming after us or people are just popping too many wine bottles uh, and champagne bottles for Thanksgiving. We don't know what it is. We're happy to have the great Matt McCarthy Big time sports radio guy in New England, writer. He's done it all. Matt, how you doing? Guys, I'm doing great. Uh, listen, you know, still uh, happy, healthy, which is all that matters. Uh, still gainfully employed, uh, at least for the time being. So a- as far as 2020 goes, uh, I'm doing quite well. It's good to be on with you guys. Yeah, I agree. We, I've kind of, I think everybody's adjusted their standards. If you're lucky enough to go, and I'm in Tampa, lucky enough to go to a restaurant and as long as the waiter doesn't hit you with a beer bottle and stab you in the leg, you're like, well, it's 2020. We got our food. We're alive. I mean, the, the, the standards have changed for good customer service. So we're going to weigh in here. So, Cam, uh, what are your thoughts on that? And uh, what, what else can you add to us and tell us about uh, Matt McCarthy that you've experienced? Because I know you guys have known each other for quite a while. And I know you like to argue with people or have spirited conversations on Twitter. So hopefully you didn't say anything too crazy to Matt McCarthy. I don't think I've ever really gotten into an argument with Matt. In fact, Matt and I agree on most things. Matt actually produced my favorite radio segment ever when Michael Felger up here was taunting him as a scared millennial that's worried about life without Tom Brady. And Matt McCarthy famously said, there is no life without Tom Brady if you don't have a plan. And as we've seen this year, the Patriots didn't have a plan. Their plan was just pick up whatever quarterback was left on the clearance table at the end of free agency And just for them, it happened to be Cam Newton, which got them some great PR because of Cam Newton, the caliber of his name, and the flashy and the popularity of Cam Newton. If it was Andy Dalton or Marcus Mariota, nobody would have cared. But that was my favorite segment I've ever heard Matt do. So I've never really gotten into an argument with Matt. Our prior guest, Dan, we've had our battles, him and I. But Matt, no. (laughs) You know, I generally, believe it or not, I try to avoid battles. Uh, Although sometimes I can be roped into it. But no, Cam, you and I have always... You know, I think we've always agreed on a lot of things, but even when we've disagreed, it's been uh, it's been very cordial. I, I've got great respect for you for your takes. I've I've always enjoyed your stuff, so it's always good to be on with you, my man. Thank you. Glad to have you here. That's great. That's great energy, Matt. We really appreciate that. And I got to get into it. And I can see uh, Dan uh, Def uh, Lishets. I I can't say his name. I don't know how to. Say it. I'll just call him Dan L. So Dan Liff, I uh, can't get his name, he, the gambling expert. He had a lot of hot takes. One of them i got to get your opinion on. We just had him on. Uh, maybe Dan Sankas. I think that was part of, uh, you know, we were talking about parlays. I think that was part of Dan's parlay there with 18 parlays going on. But he said Tom Brady has played like dog crap and, and hot garbage this year. And i got to say, I was surprised he said that because Tom Brady has had a couple bad games. He had a rough game last game against the Rams. But to me, in my opinion – I think Tom Brady, considering the new system at 43, I think he's played pretty well, all things considered. Uh, what is your take on that? And also, if you want to combine that with the Bruce Arians, air it out, risk it for the biscuit, you know, 50-yard, 60-yard bombs at every play. Uh, do you think that really is smart, given Tom Brady's skill set of being more of a, I hate to use the term game manager, but more of a cerebral quarterback, dip and dunk, picking the spots to the running back, to the tight ends, and so forth? I mean, listen, Brady has never been a, you know, air it out, bomb it down the field type of quarterback. I mean, the closest is in 2007 when he was at the height of his powers. And, oh, yeah, he had the greatest deep threat in the history of the National Football League at the height of his powers. You know, I, I don't think that the the air it out, bomb it down the field thing, it, you know, has has really ever been Brady's strength, especially at the age of 43. I mean, his accuracy on downfield passing you know, not, not just this year in the last few years has, has certainly not been, you know, elite by any standard. So I do think the coaching is a problem in Tampa Bay. I mean, I think Bruce Arians has exposed himself as a complete and total boob. Um, you know, you've got plenty of talent on this team. yet You can see how poorly coached they are. They're undisciplined. They make stupid decisions. Um, and listen, you know, I don't think Brady is as good as he once was, I think he's still, you know, pretty damn good quarterback. I think you can still win with him, but I don't think he's going to be able to cover up for any of that. I don't think many quarterbacks can cover up for a team that's undisciplined and poorly coached. You know, I mean, your quarterback can only take you so far. I mean, I think Brady has been solid this year for the Bucs. I mean, for a 43 year old quarterback, I think he's been truly outstanding. He looked awful against the Rams. Don't get me wrong, but you know, let's consider there that is a really good defense. I mean, that Rams defensive line took over 
that game in the second half. I mean, I thought Brady and the Bucks were pretty good in the first half, and then that defensive line took over that game in the second half. They can cover. I mean, the <clears> shocking <throat> thing was that that final interception. Like, that, that is so uncharacteristically Brady. I mean, he had a bad game against good defense. I'm not going to say, like, he's done or cooked like a lot of people are, but that was a shock. Like, that final pass, that interception, like, that is so... That was like watching Jared Goff. That wasn't like watching Tom Brady. Like, I was sitting there being like, okay, well, the Bucs might not win this game, but they're not going to lose it on a game-crippling interception. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. But you expect Jared Goff to do that. You don't expect Tom Brady to do that. So that's what I was surprised about. I mean, I think, you know, listen, that Bucks team beats up on bad teams. They lose to good teams. That's kind of who they are, you know, and, and I think that comes back to coaching and being prepared. And I think they've got the talent, but I just don't think they have the coaching to ultimately succeed against better teams. Yeah, I see why Cam likes you. I'd love to disagree, but I literally agree with all 10 of your points there. And to put that in context, uh, Tom Brady's got 64.5% accuracy, which is very good. He's at 2,955 yards. He's within 80 yards of the top of Patrick Mahomes, 25 touchdowns to nine picks. Obviously, the nine picks are a little high. However, you guys are looking at this through historical Tom Brady. I'm looking at this through historical Bucks quarterbacks and historical Jameis Winston. So as long as we're not doing 30 for 30, uh, I can live with a little bit of a higher interception total. It's all relative of what you're used to. So, yeah, the interceptions are a little high. But this is kind of what you talked about, about how Bruce Arians is a boob. My analogy, uh, me and Cam did a show a couple weeks ago when I put the title, uh, Bruce Arians is Donald Trump. And uh, not to get too political, and just what I mean by that is just just big and bold. Some people love him, some people hate him, but that's Bruce Arians. And as a coach, you can't act like a billionaire. You, as a coach, you have to be, ironically, in my opinion, a little bit more traditional presidential, a little bit more buttoned up, like Bill Belichick. You've got to be a little bit more, we're on to Cincinnati. To me, Bruce Arians... And I hate to say this, sometimes to me he acts like a drunken redneck at the bar. He acts like your drunken redneck friend at the bar. If I owned a team, I would risk it for the biscuit. Bruce, you would not risk it for the biscuit. I bet you I would risk it for the biscuit. Like, that is the sense that I get with Bruce. Like, you're eating wings and beer with your friends at Buffalo Wild Wings, and he's just, like, risk it for the biscuit. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Cam, I can, I can defer to you real quick, but I guess just my quick thought is that you know, I think Tom Brady is probably looking at this guy being like, hold on, I left Bill Belichick for this guy. I mean, sure, I've got, you know, way more talent on this team, but you realize that ultimately in the end, okay, you know, the, the Bucs are going to go to the playoffs, the Patriots are not. The Bucs are going to probably steamroll the Eagles or whatever crappy team comes out of the NFC East, and then they're going to get to the second round against a real team, and they're probably going to lose because they're not going to be well enough coached. All right, and, and, you know, the talent on that team won't be enough to make, make a difference against another talented team. I think Brady and Belichick eventually are going to realize, and I think we all need to realize as fans, neither of them will be as successful without them as they were together. I mean, that's ultimately what it comes down to here. Brady's going to make the playoffs. He's not going to go far. Bill's not going to make the playoffs. He's not going anywhere. So who wins in the end, really? Nobody wins. Yeah, you're Nobody. right. You're right. I mean, I've always felt like Tom Brady was the driving show, that the driving of the engine. That was what I felt. And Bill Belichick's a great coach. He's the greatest of all time. Tom Brady's the greatest quarterback of all time. But at the end of the day, I felt they kind of pushed each other. Uh, Bill Belichick got his wish. He got to manage a team and coach a team without Tom Brady. And right now, the Patriots are not looking hot. And what bothers me about Bruce Arians, and I get to watch this a lot being down here in Tampa, is that he do we have two good running backs. I firmly believe we could be smash mouth sports. We could be smash mouth football. I love it when teams play old school, run the ball, go to the tight end. Bruce Arians hates tight ends. We've had OJ Howard now for another year in a row. I know he's out for the year, but even when we had him, we didn't go to OJ Howard. We haven't really gone to Gronk. And now Brady's kind of moved on to Cameron Braid a little bit, getting him more involved. I don't care about Antonio Brown. I don't care about Chris Godwin. I don't care about Mike Evans. I would rather – I my – philosophy is this. I was on a thread today with our Bucks guys, and I said, I just want to run the ball 25 times a week against the Chiefs. I'm not worried about trying to beat Patrick Mahomes. We know how great he is. He's 9-1. and one. We know there are three-and-a-half-point favorites. My opinion for the Bucs, don't worry about winning the game. I know that might sound crazy, but what I don't want is another five-running attempt performance, and then we end up losing anyway, because I just feel like we need to stay committed to the run uh, no matter what. And if you lose, you lose. But to me, Tom Brady's strength is manage the game, check to the running backs, run the ball, play smart, and play discipline. What do you think about that? 
I mean, Cam, you know, I don't know if you want to jump in. I mean, I would agree with that. I mean, I, I think, you know, Brady is Brady runs an extremely tight ship offensively. And if you have some balance, you know, that opens up the play action. I mean, it, it's hard to think of a better quarterback, you know, on play action than Tom Brady. I mean, he's lethal, absolutely lethal on play action. And, you know, I think we saw this here with Josh McDaniels over the years, too. And, you know, Cam, you can certainly jump in on this as well, is that, you know, when you have Tom Brady and you have these weapons, there is this urge to air it out, you know, absolutely all the time, air it out. And I think, you know, teams run into trouble when, you know, you're going to put the game entirely on him because you do have Tom Brady. You want to put the game on him late, absolutely. But, you know, particularly against the Chiefs, too, you want to run the ball, you want to keep the ball out of Patrick Mahomes' you know, hands and give yourself a chance. You know, smart teams, disciplined teams, don't overuse Brady and the weapons. They've got plenty of weapons, but you have to have a semblance of balance. And I would agree with that, particularly against the Chiefs. Yeah, I mean, it's the coaching. It, that's the problem with the Bucs. And, and look, I'm not going to sit here and tell you Brady was good Monday night because he wasn't. But to, to me, the embodiment of this year's B- Buccaneers team was that Bears game on a Thursday night about six weeks ago. They're up 14 nothing at the end of the second quarter. And all they have to do, excuse me, 13 nothing, manage the ball and don't turn the ball over. But Bruce Arians wants to air it out, and the Bears score two late touchdowns, and they have the lead at halftime like that. So this is an undisciplined team. Preston, with all due respect, um, it, it just like and th- this was said from the very beginning, from the moment Brady signed with the Buccaneers. How is he going to fit in Bruce Arians' air it out system? And that's because he was never that here, except for what Matt said when they had Randy Moss. That's it. Yeah, you guys are 100% right. And um... – no, it's true. I mean, I, I'm, I've am i never been the biggest fan of Bruce Arians. Bruce Arians, and I really don't like the fact that every week, if Brady has a bad game or if there's an interception or if we lose or whatever the reason is, he keeps saying, well, Tom Brady read the route wrong. Tom Brady doesn't understand the coverages, and he's blasting Tom Brady every week. My question is, and it's my team, my Bucks team, what has Bruce Arians done? Everybody keeps talking about the risk it for the biscuit and the quarterback guru. Last time I checked, and yes, he has coached a lot of great quarterbacks as an offensive coordinator or assistant and a little bit as a head coach. He's won one playoff game. I, I, want, I want people keep forgetting about that. Tom Brady's won six Super Bowls, been to nine. Bruce Aarons has won one playoff. He doesn't have one Super Bowl as a head coach. He's got one playoff win as a head coach. So – with all due respect to Bruce Arians, I mean, I hate to say this, but I, I almost feel like Tom Brady should just say, look, these are the plays I'm comfortable with. This is what we should run. Let's check down the running backs. Let's get the tight ends involved. I don't care if we've got three receivers and none of them get 1,000 yards. I, that really means nothing to me because last year the Bucks had 2,000-yard receivers. We were 7-9. and nine. We faltered down the stretch. Uh, so, Matt, I know we said a lot there, but what are your thoughts on some of those points? Well, Listen, coaching matters in the NFL, even when you have truly great players. And I mean, the Bucks do. I mean, you know, Evans is a great player. I, I, I love Godwin. I really enjoy watching Godwin play. You know, they've got, you know, a lot of talent on defense. I mean, David is, is just spectacular. And oh, yeah, you still have Tom Brady, who, listen, he's not the player he once was, but he's still pretty, pretty damn good and he knows how to win. But coaching truly matters in the NFL. And, you know, this is the, the great. I guess the mastery of Bill Belichick is that Bill Belichick puts his players in a position to succeed. And it's amazing that other uh, coaches around the NFL can't seem to figure that element out because Bill Belichick would never run an offense that did not suit his quarterback. I mean, that's just a fact. And they're trying to run an offense that suits Cam Newton, but well, Cam Newton really isn't that good. You've got limitations there, but the fact that Bruce Arians refuses to run an offense that suits Tom Brady, which is 15 yards and in, you know, one, two, three, drop, you know, there you go. Like one, two, three, foot in the ground, balls out. Like that's it. Like that's that's the Tom Brady offense. That's his strength. The fact that they're trying to force him into something different, and you can see that friction sometimes because when they look really good, they're doing the things that Brady always did. He looks like Tom Brady. It's one, two, three, balls out. Like that's it. Less than three seconds, there you go. But when you see these bombs down the field, and I get they have the weapons to do it. I get they, you know, they're trying to get Antonio Brown into the game. They're trying to get Mike Evans into the game. It just doesn't work. It doesn't because it doesn't suit the strengths of the quarterback. You need to play it to your strengths. And good coaches do, and Bruce Arians isn't a good coach. It's really that Yeah, simple. Yeah, you're 100% right. And I agree with everything you guys are saying, and it's true. Because I look at it like our team is – 
And I know he's got risk it for the biscuit, which has gone crazy. And I'm sick of hearing about risk it. And I'm sick of hearing about biscuits. I just, I can't, I keep going back to, he sounds like a drunken redneck at the bar. And I hate to say that analogy, but he does with this. It, when I heard Bill Belichick, it's one of Cincinnati. We're playing smart. He never throws his team under the bus. And like you said, what's great about Bill Belichick, the Patriots are one of the top four running teams in the league, which is unbelievable. I don't remember them ever being a top five running team. Uh, maybe the one year with Corey Dillon, but other than that, the last 20 years with Tom Brady, they've not been a top five running team. Maybe you can, uh, correct me, Matt, if you remember offhand. Yeah, I mean, let's, uh, as far as like top five statistics. Top five, running, yeah. Statistics. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, I, I, I don't have the statistics in front of me. I mean, I can tell you at the end of 2018, you know, they transformed in the middle of that year. Actually, not even in the middle of that year. And Cam, you can speak to this at well, as well. At the, year, yeah. at the end of that year, after the Pittsburgh game, when it looked like the Patriots were done. I mean, they were yeah. cooked. They went into Pittsburgh and they lost. They had like Josh Gordon out there. They were running these four wide receiver sets. Like the it was career. They right, exactly. And they didn't they didn't have the horses, you know, as far as or the weapons offensively. So they said, you know what, we're gonna ground and pound. Like this is what we're gonna do. And they changed that offense on a dime and won a Super Bowl as a result, because they started playing to their strengths and they realized that their strength was not Tom Brady airing it out. Now, you know, they did need in in the Kansas City AFC Championship game that year, Cam, you know, they did need on third and nine, third and nine, third and 10, Edelman, Gronk, Gronk. I mean, they needed that at the end, but they still had just enough to get it done and Brady got it done. But that team was a ground and pound at the very end because they realized this is our best chance of winning. And good coaches do that. Bill Belichick realized that. The problem is Bruce Arians is not going to realize it because he is not a good coach. You're he's right. He's, he's not a good coach. He's stubborn as hell. And I want to add one thing here is I know it's very boring, but look at the Cleveland Browns. They're seven and three. OK, they don't have a great quarterback. And I'm sorry, uh, Cam has said, don't be so harsh on Baker. Mayfield. I'm not a fan of Baker Mayfield. I never was. In fact, I have to hate Baker Mayfield so much. I know that's a strong word. I said if I was a scout in that room, I would have you would have had to beat it out of me to make me turn in that card. I would not I would not have turned in that card for Baker Mayfield. I'm not a fan of Baker Mayfield. But having said all that, the Cleveland Browns have an okay, solid defense, but they have a power running game with Nick Chubb, with Kareem Hunt. They're close in every game. The Buc- I would much rather see the Bucs. This is, sounds like a crazy take. Would rather play more like the Cleveland Browns and less like uh, the Rams or the Chiefs or whoever. And what I mean by that is we have two strong running backs of Ronald Jones, Leonard Fournette. We could easily run the ball. 28 to 30 times a game, dip and dunk, try to win games 20 to 17, 23 to 20, make it a more manageable game. And in that fourth quarter, like a Derrick Henry, a Leonard Fournette could absolutely be getting five and six yards of carry and be running downhill. But literally, and I'm still embarrassed, and I don't know if you saw this, but a few weeks ago, we had five rushing attempts in the whole game and we lost. And that includes the kneel down for a negative play at the end. Uh, so I know we've only got a couple minutes left, but I just, I, I, that is a coaching. That is a hundred percent coaching five running plays. What do you, what do you think about that guys? No, I mean, it, you're, it, he's just Bruce Arians is the prototype of that coaches. We do what we do and we don't adjust the fact that in your two saints games at no point did he think the double team Cameron Jordan mm-hmm. is the cl- classic example of that. And Cameron Jordan teed off on, on Tom Brady in both of those games. He never put a tight end over there or running back over there just to chip Cameron Jordan and slow him down. And he always gets his quarterbacks. There's two constants in Bruce Arians. His first year quarterback struggle and his quarterbacks get killed because they always get hit because he does not adjust. He's a stubborn coach. He feels like it's his way or the highway. As we've seen how many times he's been you know, throwing Brady under the bus after these games. And I think, frankly, if you want to maximize your potential these next two years, Bruce Arians isn't the coach for your team. No, what do you I, thought? Couldn't agree. Yeah. I could not agree more with that. I mean, listen. You're all in at this point if you're the Bucs. I mean, I, you hate to turn this into the NBA, but at the end of this season, you know, if I'm Bucs or in ownership, I go to Tom Brady and say, listen, I know we've got you for one more year. We're going all out. We're going to try and win a Super Bowl. Who's your guy? Name your guy. We'll get him. Is it McDaniels? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure. Who's your guy? Is there a guy from, you know, that you're familiar with? The Belichick coaching. I, like, Go back to, like, if there's some guy you liked at Michigan, we'll bring him in. Anybody. We will bring – is Lloyd Carr, like, what's it, is he available? Like, I, I don't know. You you get my point. Like, you almost have to go completely all in on the Brady thing. And if it's not going to work out between Brady and Bruce Arians, you fire the coach. You absolutely, you're too far down that road. Like, what do you do? Do you keep Bruce Arians around, flounder for a year, have Brady leave, go somewhere else? 
And then, I don't know, what, what are you left with at that point? You know, a whole bunch of veteran guys who were there because they wanted a chance to win a Super Bowl. They all leave. Like, it's just, and then who's your quarterback? Like, it's, you, you if you're the Bucks, you've got a two-year window, now a one-and-a-half-year window, and you better maximize it. Otherwise, what's on the other side of this? I don't know. Yeah, you're 100 percent right. I, I would fire Bruce Arians today, and that's not a, and that's not meant to be a hot take. I'm being told I've never been sold on Bruce Arians. I would fire him today and hand the keys over to Todd Bowles. And if Todd Bowles doesn't perform, then he's out too. But I think Todd Bowles actually is underrated as a coach. He was a head coach before. He did the best he could with the Jets, uh, with as good as you can with that. I mean, look at the Jets are 0 10 this year, so they've gotten worse from four and twelve. So they continue to get worse and worse and worse. I do think coaching matters. Um, last thing I'll say, we appreciate your time, Matt. Uh, I know we've got a couple over the 15 minutes here. That's Last awesome. question is, uh, wh- what would you like your Patriots to do? I-, I-, I know the season's not over. I know they're four and six. They got six games to go. Realistically, they're not going to the playoffs. What would you like to see the future for the Patriots? Do you want them to try to get in the top 10 draft a quarterback, or do you want them to just try to overpay for receivers, uh, Adam Thielen, whoever? What-, what would be your ideal offseason for the Patriots? Well, uh, first and foremost, it cannot be Cam Newton. I mean, that's the most important thing. Cam Newton is not your quarterback moving forward. Can't be. I, I see you shaking your head, Cam. I know you agree with that. Like, Cam Newton's just not that good. I mean, he's just not. He, not he is who he is. He is a career loser with a bum shoulder. I mean, that's, listen, he, he can make some spectacular plays, you know, with his legs, but it's just not enough. Like, you see why this guy has never won anything. You know, the Patriots have played five one-score games. They're one and four in those games. You have Tom Brady, even with a team that's not very good, you go at least three and two, maybe four and one in those games, just because he doesn't screw it up at the end the way that Cam Newton does. You beat the Denver Broncos, you beat, you know, the Buffalo Bills because you don't fumble it away. Like that's do you lose to the two and eight Houston Texans if you have Tom Brady? Probably not, because he just doesn't screw it up. And ultimately Cam Newton is a player who screws it up when it matters the most. So it cannot be Cam Newton. As far as who it is. That's the big question. That's the million-dollar question, and it's not easy to find quarterbacks in the NFL. And for some reason, there's been this sense here in New England, and I'm sure you could agree with this, Cam, as well, that you can just, like, find a quarterback. That's not how it works, no. okay? Even with Bill Belichick and Tom Brady, uh, you know, Bill Belichick and this organization, like, that is not how it works. I think the ideal scenario for the Patriots is you move on, and then you go with some type of stopgap again, you know, whether it's, uh, like Jimmy a case, Gary. like a case Keenum, Jimmy G, one of those kind of guys, or Jimmy or... G's the per- Jimmy G's the perfect option for them because he's been in the system before. And, the and coach, then you just try and and then you just I'm sorry, what'd you say, Cam? And the coach loves him, as we all know. Belichick loves Garoppolo, and and that's the most important thing. I think there are limitations there with the player, but you bring in Garoppolo and then you rebuild the team, and then you reevaluate the quarterback position in another year or two. You know, that's that's what I do. I mean, I almost go into the draft, and unless there's a guy I absolutely love as a quarterback, I start rebuilding the rest of this team, and I almost kick the quarterback thing down the road. I kick it down, you know, you know, kick the can on that a bit because you have bigger problems than just quarterback. Quarterback is your biggest problem, but you need to rebuild the talent on this team, you know, really from the ground up. So if there isn't that, you know, bona fide guy in the draft where you're sitting – then rebuild the rest of the team, try and get a Jimmy Garoppolo, try and get, you know, somebody else to serve as a stopgap. And then there you go. But, you know, I, I don't think this is a quick turnaround for this team. I don't. I, I think they're I think they're in, in, in some trouble moving forward. Excuse me, Cam, what are your thoughts on that? No, I'm with Matt. I, I don't think this, this seems to be a lot of confidence up here that this will be a quick turnaround. And the Patriots will be back to maybe not winning Super Bowls, but contending for the playoffs soon. I don't feel that way. Mm-hmm. First of all, I don't know if Bill Belichick's back next year. Remember, Vegas odds said that he was gone before the season started. And some books that he would this would be his last year with the Patriots, first of all. They don't have a quarterback. And, and one of these veteran guys, they're all stopgap guys. They're not going to have a high enough pick to get Justin Fields now because they beat the Jets and beat the Ravens. So that's out. The only quarterback they might get now is Trey Lance. And every key player on this team is either old or a free agent in the next two years. So there's a long road ahead for the Patriots here. This is not going to be a quick fix. Can they win maybe seven or eight games next year? Maybe. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to be back into elite contention anytime soon. Yeah, and and I would just say, Cam, you know, that I I don't want to see them bottom out. I don't because I think, you know, there's no reason that a Bill Belichick coach team should ever bottom out, even with – 
some talent deficiencies. You know, that's the advantage of having a Bill Belichick is that theoretically your team is always going to be competitive. You know, I think, you know, they are the type of team that can build from the middle because I don't <clears> think <throat> in, you know, build from the middle. I mean, like, you know, this is not the NBA. Like you go seven and nine next year, like you can continue to take steps like and I don't think there are any guarantees that if you're in the top 10 of the draft that you find that quarterback. You know, it's just I, quarterbacks are so hard to find. Like I, I almost think and, and this may sound crazy <coughs> that like I almost think that you have almost as good a chance to find that guy in the second round as you do in the top 10. Because good teams, successful franchises have done that. You know, the Seahawks with Russell Wilson, the Patriots with Jimmy Garoppolo. And again, limitations, I understand there. But is he a starting quarterback in the NFL? Yes, he is. And you find that guy in the second round. Like, I think the Patriots, if there's any team that can do it, it's them. So I want to see them build from the middle. Don't bottom out. I I hate the idea of tanking. Build from the middle and see where you go. Yeah, I agree with you. A lot of great takes there. I I firmly believe and I agree with your strategy. Load up my philosophy is load up O line D line. Load up O line D line. If you have to get Case Keenum for a year, or if you have to get a Jimmy G, you know, for a year or two to find your perfect ideal franchise guy, because that, that does take some time. Because again, we talked about earlier, Baker Mayfield's not the ideal guy. Sam Darnold's not the I mean, these are top three, top four picks. I hate to be too quick to pull the trigger, but I don't think two is the guy. I, I really don't. I was never sold on two. I thought he played for the Alabama machine. And I'm a little concerned when guys play at powerhouses where they've got the best O-line, the best running backs, the best at every spot. It was was a six-foot, average build, average size guy, below average intelligence, doesn't have elite athleticism. I mean, I see no evidence that he can be the difference. And when I see a guy like a Justin Herbert, to me, that's the guy you want. Uh, I mean, I hate to say it with Joe Burrow. I hope his career's not over, but he, in Cincinnati, they just have a horrible track record. But Justin Herbert is a guy that I think I couldn't say enough great things. I think this guy's the next big deal. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Matt? Uh, boy, I, I uh, listen, I, I'm an extremely casual Oregon Ducks fan. Uh, we do not. And when I say extremely casual, <laughs> I mean, like, extremely casual. We don't have big time college football here. I don't give a damn about college football, but I mean, I've you've got, thought about Oregon Ducks one time. Uh, a couple yeah. Years yeah. Ago. <laughs> so, uh, but I've got a lot of family in, in Oregon. I've spent a lot of time in Oregon. I've spent a lot of time in Eugene. So I just kind of casually adopted them. Uh, I was dead wrong about Herbert. I was actually at the Pac-12 championship game uh, last year, okay. and I was watching Herbert, and there were discussions, oh, you know, the Patriots could be interested. And I was like, no, nope, not this guy. Can't throw, can't throw. Of course, I'm dead wrong about that. He looks fantastic. Um, so clearly, I'm not the guy you want evaluating quarterbacks. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Herbert's Herbert's been legit, you know. But, like, here's the thing. I mean, Herbert was what, the third quarterback drafted? Yeah. Uh, you, he was drafted so, six overall by the Charters, yeah. Right. And he's, so, and he's big. He's six six. He's almost two forty. He's big. He's strong. I mean, he has the, all the check marks that you that you like. Right. So I think the point is, and it, and it's not like every draft goes this way, but in some ways, the difference between the third quarterback and the first quarterback, you can find, you know, like it, there's no guarantee that the first quarterback off the board is that good. I mean, I think we've seen that now. You know, there are certainly plenty of examples where they are and plenty of examples where they aren't. I trust Bill Belichick to make that call. I would I would agree. Now, are you concerned at all? Because in my opinion, as an outsider, not in the New England bubble where where, you know, everybody goes to the church of Bill Belichick where he can do no wrong. Are, are you concerned um, that the drafting of Bill Belichick could be the end of Bill Belichick in New England? Not this year, but in the next coming years. Because, and I went with Cam over this morning, um, just a couple years ago, they drafted Sony Michelle over Nick Chubb, Lamar Jackson, uh, some of the other guys uh, that we mentioned on that, Ronald Jones. Uh, not that he is the end all be all, but I think he's a better running back than Sony Michelle. So there's it's just DK Metcalf. I mean, there's been a lot of guys. Uh, Justin Jefferson. There's just been a lot of guys that when you choose an Akil Harry and a Sony Michelle over some of those elite guys, that can wreck your franchise. No, I, listen, he's been he's been putrid in the draft. I mean, it's been brutal. I mean, the Akil Harry pick over literally every other wide receiver <laughs> in that draft is is mind boggling. Like you, and it's like, what did they ever see in this guy? I mean, he's big. That's it. DK Metcalf is bigger. Like, I he's mean, huge. Like, yeah, like he's, he's a massive. linebacker. Yeah, he's like, massive. So how do you not how do you not recognize that? Like, how do you make that evaluation? I mean, don't get me wrong. The evaluations that have been horrific. But, you know, when it comes to evaluating the quarterback position, 
they've been pretty good. I mean, I shouldn't say they've been pretty good. They've been really good. They drafted Tom Brady. You know, they drafted Jimmy Garoppolo. I'm sure they've had some misses in there. You know, Ryan Mallett wasn't exactly great. But, you know, they've drafted two guys who have been NFL starters in the last 20 years. And, you know, not a lot of franchises can say that. Like, that's right. tough. That's really tough, what they've done. So I trust Bill Belichick evaluating the quarterback position a hell of a lot more than I trust him evaluating skill positions. That's Matt, for- I, I appreciate your take there. I got to ask you. I got to ask you because this is what I believe. I, I firmly believe that Tom Brady bailed out Bill Belichick, in my opinion, more than Bill Belichick bailed out Tom Brady. Here's what I mean by that. Bill Belichick has never been good at at analyzing receivers. I mean, because my theory is even towards the end with Tom Brady, you can't expect a drug addict Josh Gordon and Antonio Brown to freeze his feet and fight his coach. Like they were all those crazy things. Like you really can't, in my opinion, or Corey Dillon getting in fights when he was Cincinnati and leaving Randy Moss. Like, I feel like they've been very, very fortunate because of Tom Brady always winning 12, 13 wins that they can take this troubled guy, take this Chad John. They can take pick and pick these guys off a team and put them up as part of the cake and make this great cake. But to me, Tom Brady is what makes the engine work. Like if they'd have had a Jared Stidham for years or Cam Newton now for years, like they're just, even this year, they're not getting all these other guys. And that that is my concern with the Patriots moving forward for the future, for the rebuild. Well, that's the magic of Bill Belichick and Tom Brady together, right? You know, when you've got the two greatest who have ever done it at their respective jobs, you know, you can, you know, when you put that that force together, you can bring in players right. and make it work. Like that was, and it, you know, goes back to the original point that, Bill will never be as successful without Tom and Tom will ne- never be as successful without Bill because it was truly the combination that made them special. Like, I mean, that's, that's what it is now. You know, Brady's going to go to the playoffs. He's going to win a game, you know, and that's going to be it. Bill's not going to go to the playoffs. He's got to rebuild the team, but neither of them are going to do what they did without each other. And that's the magic of them. You know, is that when you put it together, it's not, you know, separate, they're both great separately, when you talk about historically good, you know, that can't happen without the two of them working together. So you're saying you're taking the under on six more Super Bowls for Tom Brady. That's what you're saying. <laughs> I'm going to take, I'm going to take the under on uh, a half and I'm going to say zero. So, oh yes. man. I was going to say, don't take the under on one. Don't take the under on one. Take the under on one oh, for both of them. Don't do it. Tom, you know, we've all seen that Sports Illustrated cover where Tom Brady's like 50. He's got the gray beard and the gray hair. Cam, uh, you know, we appreciate having Matt on. Let, let's let you in, uh, Cam. Anything else you want to you address before we wrap this up? Matt, since you're the baseball guy, I have to ask you one question. Is this finally Kurt Schilling's year? Yes, it is. Yeah, Kurt Schilling's going to get in. He's going to be the only guy who gets in. You know, you can see the way that, that, that the Hall of Fame is trending. Um, you know, you, could, you knew, you know, this is his ninth year of eligibility. There are no big first timers on the ballot so we always see the guy who is you know the closest to getting in the hall of fame get in in those years i think kurt schilling gets in this year um which you know of course is is interesting for many reasons but i I think the 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 fascinating thing here is next year it's roger clemens and barry bonds final year on the ballot and it's the first year on the ballot for david ortiz and alex rodriguez it is the most fascinating Hall of Fame ballot, I think, ever. Because it's the end of the line for two of the biggest steroid guys, two guys who I think should be in the Hall of Fame, and it's the beginning for, I think, some some players who obviously were, ju- were juicing and were taking roids, but have gotten the public forgiveness that Bonds and Clemens never have. You know, A-Rod has totally uh, changed his public persona. David Ortiz has the presidential pardon, uh, as, as Dan Shaughnessy in Boston coined it, when Rob Manford came to Boston as he was retiring and basically poo-pooed, you know, the 2003 list that David Ortiz p- appeared on. So we've got some fascinating things coming up from the Hall of Fame, not just this year, but <clears throat> next year is the ultimate moment for the Baseball Hall of Fame. Clemens and Bonds, their final year, Ortiz and A-Rod, their first year. Because you can't put Ortiz and A-Rod in and let Clemens and a- and, uh, and Bonds fall off the ballot. They're going to fall off the ballot. It's fascinating. Can't wait for it. Those two guys are hated, Clemens and Bonds. They yeah. are hated, so they are polarizing. So I think that's a great way to leave it. Matt, great takes. Way to whack, uh, wrap up the show. So thanks again for coming on. They can reach out to you on Twitter. And thanks again. We'll have to do this again. Guys, it's fun. Always good to be on with you. Thanks for having me. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.